This is Thursday, November 20th, 2014. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today James Zograkos. Welcome, James. My pleasure. May I ask when you were born? When? When? July 23, 1919. And where were you born? Springfield, Massachusetts. And what town do you currently live in? I live in Westboro, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I am a widower. Do you have children? I have four children. Uh, grandchildren? I like to make a correction. I have three children mm -hmm. and I have four grandchildren. Okay. Tell us what Springfield was like growing up. Uh, I, I can't tell you that because I, uh, I, was, I was born in Springfield, but uh, as a baby we moved to Boston, so I have no knowledge of Springfield. What part of Boston did you grow up in? The South End. And tell us what the South End was like growing up. At that time, it was a, uh, it was one big, happy uh, neighborhood, with uh, Greek people, Italian people, uh, Polish people, Jewish people, black people, one conglomerate of, of different nations, and we all got along beautifully. What did your parents do for a living? Uh, my father had a, uh, a small restaurant, which I don't remember because he, he got sick and he died later in the hospital. And my, uh, my mother uh, had the duties of raising me and my brother. What do you remember about the Great Depression? The Great Depression, I remember very, very well because uh, as a youngster, oh, about 12, as a young teenager, 12, 13, 14, I used to shine shoes. And I had a shoe box. With, all, the, all the young boys of my age, we all did the same thing. We had a shoe box with shoe paste and the strap and all that, and we would walk downtown Boston, try to shine shoes. At that time, shoe shine was five cents. And if we got someone who was generous, he gave us 10 cents. But uh, talking about depression, if we made uh, if we made 50 cents for the day uh, or a dollar for the day, that was enough to buy a loaf of bread, a dozen of eggs, some butter, and um, maybe some bologna. But we, we, that, that one dollar or so did bring food to the table. James, did you go to school? I went to school in Boston. Did you go to high school? I went to high school. And which high school was that? Boston English High School. And while you were in high school, were you made aware of events happening overseas? Uh, y yes and no. Uh, in the Boston English High School, we had uh, what we call military drill. We had, uh, we had special uniforms and all that, but we were, we were t taking military uh, lessons. Okay. And uh, I, I'll always remember a Major Driscoll, who was a veteran of World War I. He taught us everything about uh, uh, formation, the close auto, all, uh, close auto drill, things like that. And I uh, was also a member of the Boston English High School rifle team. I got to be a a pro marksman, a marksman, and then a sharpshooter. And that was my training. 
Sounds like fun. <laughs> it, it was fun, yeah. And I still have the, uh, I still have the medals that I got for English high school. Now, James, what did you do after high school? After high school, um, uh, my, my mother was, was from the old school, and to most most people coming f from uh, other countries, they believe strongly in education, and uh, we had a drugstore at the corner of our street where we used to go and get our ice cream cones for a nickel. Uh, if we if we got a cut or something, we went into the drugstore and. The owner there would just put a little iodine on it, a little bandage, and I got to uh, I got to like the profession of pharmacy. And uh, talking with my mother and things like that, I told my mother that uh, uh, I like to go to school for pharmacy, but uh, after graduating, I would like to work for about a year to get money to go to school. And my mother said, uh, no way. Now I gotta tell you about, after graduating high school, I went into college right away in, in, in September of that year. And uh, what my mother had done, now you have to remember my mother had no education at all, but uh, it seems all her decisions were done because uh, you, you might compare my mother's uh, outlook on life and the outlook of life from a, very, a, a lot of people. Uh, you, 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 you get to the point where you said, gee, my mother must have gone to college or something because she knew so much. You, you wanted out. So uh, when she said, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> when she said, uh, no, you're going to go to school in September. Uh, what she had done, she went to a. It was it was it, it, it was a financial institution. It was called the Morris Plan, and she borrowed three hundred dollars. That was a lot of money in those years, and uh, by buying by getting a three hundred dollar loan, right away this Morris Plan kept. Uh, Thirty dollars. That was the interest. So we actually got net <coughs> of two hundred and seventy dollars, and that was enough to start me in school. And uh, I d uh, uh, go going to, going to school, I worked uh, part time in the library. I worked at a hotel as a busboy, uh, just to make money to help going to school. At that time, my school was the Massachusetts College of Pharmacy. So when you were um, enrolled in the Mass College of Pharmacy, what year was that? That was in 1936. Mm -hmm. It was a four-year course. And what did you learn at Mass College of Pharmacy? I learned... Uh, I learned how to mix medications, how to how to make uh, pills, how to make solutions, how to make capsules, uh, how to recognize different plants. Uh, uh, we, we had a course in uh, what they call inorganic chemistry, and then we had organic chemistry. And we got a pretty good education for for four years as a pharmacist. And did you graduate? I graduated. In 1940? 1940. What did you do after you graduated from college? Well, after I graduated, uh, I graduated in, I believe it was in June of 19... 1940, and at that time, the State Board of Registration and Pharmacy came to the college, and uh, the graduating class t 
took different exams, and when they passed, they became registered. Now, in my case, I couldn't take the examination because I was only 20 years old. I had to be 21. <laughs> so I was just a baby. Now, uh, because at the time with schooling and all that, we did have a lot of expenses. Uh, we lived in a four tenement uh, home. And uh, you, you might say we, we owned, uh, owned the building, but it was, something wasn't easy because of depression and all that. So we still had expenses. And uh, I, uh, I couldn't, I, I didn't take the state board when I became 21. Uh, I wanted to work and m make some money. And my brother did the same thing so we could get caught up with uh, our debts that my mother had and the debts that I had. And uh, for about a year or so, I worked at a nightclub where I had a, what they call a flower concession, okay? And at that time, the average, uh, we had neighbors who worked as waiters, or what they called countermen in different restaurants. And their, sal their average salary would be about, let's say about $20 a week. And where I, where I worked as in the concession, I was able to make about 50 and $60 a week. That was a lot of money. And my mother, being bothered, she said, uh, Jim, you, you're a pharmacist. You have to take examination. You can't do what you're doing now. I said, but mom, I can make some money now. We can get caught up, and then I'll get to it. So without going into, into any more details, when the time came that I could uh, do that, I left the concession and I worked in a drugstore as a clerk for $15 a week because the requirements to take the state board, you had to have one year of apprenticeship. So while I'm doing my apprenticeship, the war break out and it was Pearl Harbor. Go. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Pearl Harbor. The Japanese bought the uh, bomb Pearl Harbor. That was in December. And the next month in January, I get I get a notice from the draft board that I was physically able <laughs> to be part of the armed forces. Uh, okay, James, can we interrupt and just kind of go back to what were you doing on December seventh, nineteen forty-one, when you heard about the attack? Okay. Uh, that was on a Sunday, and one of the one of our neighbors had a son who was getting married, and at the uh, at, re at the reception that evening, I would say about six o'clock or so, we got the news that Pearl Harbor was bombed, and we, like everybody else in this country, it, we didn't know what Pearl Harbor was. It didn't dawn on us until a day after day, we were getting all the reports for what happened to our Navy in Pearl Harbor, the people that got killed and all that information. So uh, I went to the state, to the uh, draft board, and I asked for a two week extension. And the reason I wanted the extension, I wanted to I wanted to take my examination to get my registration as a registered pharmacist. And they refused. They told me there was a war going on. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I know there's a war going on, but I'm just asking for a two-week extension. When I take the examination, I'll be very happy to, uh, you know, to get into the service. And that was it. A few days later, I report to Fort Devons and my career started. And uh, Fort Devons means that I take it you went into the Army. Into the Army, yeah. yeah. Tell us what basic was like. 
I went into uh, at, at four, I went into Fort Devens, and uh, uh, and uh, I, I was given all kinds of duty, KP, which meant working in the kitchen and washing these big tubs and pots and pans and things like that. And every, every day there was so many of the inductees that were. Uh, uh, were, were picked out and they were shipped out to different camps for their basic training. And uh, day after day, my name was not was not called. So after about maybe about two weeks, I went into the main office and I asked, "Why am I not being uh, picked to, to go to basic training?" And the that was told, "What is your profession?" I said, "I'm I'm a pharmacist." Oh. You're probably going to go into the medical course. So when I heard that, I said, "Well, I'll be able. To, I'll be doing uh, my service as a in the medical field." And that's right. So that was okay. About two, three days later, they woke us up at about two o'clock in the morning. They drove us to the warehouse, and we got inoculations. In, in both shoulders, back and forth, all kinds of uh, 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 inoculations, uh, tetanus, the malaria, things like that. <coughs> Put us on a train, and I ended up in South Carolina, in Camp Croft. And it was there that we were going to get our basic training. So now I'm assigned to the infantry, and after a few days, I went in to talk to my uh, commanding officer and asked him, why am I in the infantry when I'm supposed to be in the medical corps? And the excuse they gave me was, well, you, you still have to do your basic training. And once you finish your basic training, Uh, you'll be assigned to a, a regular position. Well, that's okay. So we did basic training. Uh, I got to be. Uh, <laughs> I look back sometime and I wonder how did I do it, and if I was in the infantry fighting the enemy, how would I be reacting? But I got to be an expert at uh, what they call jiu jitsu. I got to be an expert in of using a bayonet to kill the enemy. I got became an expert with dynamite, everything concerning basic training. That was fine. At the end of the training, everybody was called out to the <coughs> to the uh, athletic field and uh, a, uh, an, an officer was reading off the different names and where the uh, where each inductee was going to be assigned for permanent, uh, you know, training. So it went down to uh, so and so is going into artillery, so and so is going into uh, the radio, something like that. It came to radio, and I, I haven't heard my name yet. I'm saying, well. They probably call me and say, "You're on the medical corps." So while they're reading the, <coughs> while they're reading the names on the radio, the last name they call was mine, and I, I, uh, I, 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 I got very disgusted that time. What am I doing in radio? My my job is uh, being a medical corps where I can do my best to serve my country, my duty, and I had, couldn't do anything about it. So now I had to study, uh, uh, I had to study radio. Uh, we, we had two or three hours in the morning, two or three hours in the afternoon, wearing headsets and learning the Morse code. And after about <coughs> three or four days, I, could, I couldn't take it anymore. And I took the uh, one afternoon, it was about 90 degrees. 
I took off the uh, headset, I threw them down at the table and I walked out and I was threatened with uh, court martial and things like that if I uh, did something like that as well. I, I, just, I just can't do it. You want to court martial me? Okay. But I was very, very disgusted and it, it bothered me uh, psychologically. It, 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 it wasn't me. So uh, I was called into the commander's office. He says, I can't do anything for you, but I can take you out radio and put you into communications. And to describe what it was like, what they called the message center, and what the message center was. Uh, the, the, what the medical center, what the uh, message center was, was coding, decoding, uh, communications, and things like that. And when I was in that part of the training, I was an expert at climbing telephone poles. <laughs> uh, and, and I kept wondering to myself, good God, I'm a pharmacist, what the heck am I doing? <laughs> You were radio and climbing telephone poles and all that. So that was fine. So at the end of the, close to the end of the training, uh, my, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, officer in charge came up to me and said, you know, you did, you did a very nice job with message center. And uh, would you like to stay with, with our group? and become an instructor. I said, well, I'll be an instructor. It, it would de now, it, this would de delay what's going to happen to me if I you know, get into combat and things like that. So I said, OK, I'll take it. So uh, the very same afternoon, I was walking to, uh, I was walking to the, the call of PX, and uh, I wanted to buy some candy or something like that. So as I'm walking up the street, I passed by the, I passed by uh, the the officers' barracks, and I happened to look over in the parking lot, and I see a, I saw a, a black Chevrolet sedan with Massachusetts number plates, and I looked at, it, and I looked at, it, and I said. I, I know I know that car, and the at, at that time because if if you at that time if your number plate started with six like six hundred and something that meant <coughs> that meant it was the Boston area, so I walked into the parking lot and I got a. Uh, a sergeant, I asked him, uh, do you know who's, who belongs to that car? He said, well, that belongs to uh, Lieutenant Nolan. Now when he said Lieutenant Nolan, now I knew whose car it was. I knew who Lieutenant Nolan was. And he was, he was the brother of a, a girl that worked for me in the uh, South Boston Public Library. And uh, uh, Mr. Lieutenant Nolan, we, we called him Bud. Bud would come by at night and, and pick me up, pick up his, his sister, and drive me home, and then they'd take off. So I asked the sergeant, is the, uh, <coughs> is, is, the, is the lieutenant here? He said, yeah, I think he is. So he showed me where it was, walked in. And, there's Bud Nolan, we hugged each other. Gee, how are you? Well, what a coincidence and all that. We had a couple of beers. And then he said to me, uh, you know, he said, you guys are pretty lucky. I said, what do, what do you mean lucky? He said, you're going to go to Fort Devens. So when I heard Fort Devens, that meant, you know, close to home. I was an hour away from home. So I said, are you sure? He says, oh, yeah, you'll be, you be, you be joining the 45th Division at Fort Devon. So, so now I had a problem. I went back to my, my, uh, my, my uh, 
my uh, uh, well, not command, my company commander. That's it. And I said to him, "Sir, uh, uh, I have a problem." He said, "What's your problem?" I said, "You know, <coughs> I, uh, I was thinking about being an, an instructor, but uh, I, I, I changed my mind. So what, what do you change your mind for?" So I thought I was pretty cute. I said, "Well, you know, sir, I, I don't. I, I still like to be with all my buddies." <laughs> that was my excuse to say uh, what I was planning to do. So I said, well, "Okay." So I'll make a long story short. A couple of days, we we'll put on uh, a truck. We go to the trains, and we end up in Fort Devens, and. Fort Devons, we got on this truck and I Okay, so James, when did you go back to Fort Devons? Uh, I would say about May of 1942. It was after our basic training. And what did you do when you got to Devons? Well, we got to Fort Devons. We were assigned to the 45th Division. And I sat up front with the driver and I, I didn't like what he said. He said, you know, you guys are all set. You're going to be out of here in 30 days. What are you talking about? Oh, you're going to go to Africa in 30 days. <laughs> so that, that was quite a shock. And that was how we, we got that respective uh, barracks. And what we do, we were waiting for you know, special orders we were going to ship and all that. So one week went by, another week went by, a third week went by, and week after week, nothing was happening. And we had, uh, we had, the, 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 there was a general, his name was General Key, K-E-Y, he was a general in charge of the 45th Division. And the, the story went around that every weekend, he would go to Washington, D.C., to the Pentagon and, and tell his superiors that my, uh, my outfit isn't ready for combat yet. Because we got the feeling the general didn't want to go overseas either. <laughs> so week after week, the same thing. My, my outfit's not ready yet. In the meantime, we're not getting any any training at all. And one afternoon, I, I went up to the uh, Fort Devons Hospital, and I spoke with a major who was head of the hospital, and I told him my situation. I said, you know, I'm a pharmacist. I'm in the infantry. Is there any way that I can get into the medical corps? And the major said, Retreat. He said, I can use a pharmacist. He said, you know what I will do? I will make, <coughs> I will, uh, uh, I, I can start to transfer papers. And the best I can do for you, I can give you the rank of sergeant. I said, sir, I, I don't need any stripes when I just get me into the medical corps so that I can do my, my, uh, my prof profession the right way. So I made out the papers. I took them back. I went to my company commander. He signed them. I went to the next uh, step. I forget, I think it was battalion. He signed them. I went to up the next step higher. And I walked in, there was a, a lieutenant there sitting behind the desk. <coughs> he looked at the papers, he threw them back at me. He says, he says I'm not going to sign them. Says, I says, why? What's wrong with them? I'm getting into the medical corps, and that's my line. He says, you know there's a war going on? I says, yes, sir, I do. But I still like to do my duty as my best profession. So he said, no, I'm not going to sign this. So that was it. Now I'm really depressed. <laughs> now I'm depressed. 
we're, I'm in the infantry. We get no training at all. They're saying we're going to go to uh, Africa. Then a few days later, they gave us, uh, we went to the warehouse and they gave us uh, snow boots and things like that. Uh, now we're going to go to Alaska. <laughs> who, know, who knows that? They were doing things like that. that nobody knew actually where we were going. So about, <coughs> I, walked, I walked by one office at uh, Fort Devens. It was the aviation board, they called it. And uh, I had heard that if you, if you take the examination for the Air Corps, you can, you can, you know, you can get into the Air Corps. So I said, well, let me try that. So I walked in, sure enough, there was an opening. I sat down, I took the examination. So now, James, you are taking the examination I took to- the examination. Mm -hmm. To enter it the- It took about an hour, and as I walked out, mm -hmm. I asked a, uh, a sergeant at the desk, can I find out if I passed the examination or not? He said, he says, I can do it right away. It was a type of examination where it was a special form. You put something over and just check the blocks. So after about 10 minutes, he said, you know, uh, he says, soldier says, you're in the Air Corps now. He said, now I felt a lot of relief. I said, Gee, now I'm, at least I'm in the Air Corps. The reason I liked that was because uh, we got no training in, as the infantry, and uh, uh, how, how does this country send young boys in combat and they don't have the experience of fighting? And, and to me, that, that, that was a bad, bad thing to do. And I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead. This 45th Division that I was in eventually, uh, they, uh, they got some kind of training. They ended up in Italy. They ended up in uh, one invasion, and they got slaughtered. I had friends of mine that, uh, uh, in the 45th Division, I was getting letters from one of my best buddies. He said the, uh, at, at the beach landing, the Germans he just machine gun fire all over the place, and he's, He's naming names, so and so got killed, the other one lost his leg. And uh, uh, at, at times I would cry because of, uh, he, uh, I was crying because of the war. You know, we're, we're fighting, we're, we're trying to do a job, and the boys are getting killed. So that was all right. Now the other thing was, <coughs> when, I, when I first got drafted, you got $21 a month. And I think after three months, we got $30 a month. As soon as I got into the Air Corps, I jumped up to $75 a month. I'm getting a lot of money then. <laughs> so that was fine. So uh, uh, about a, the sergeant at the, uh, at the Air Corps desk he said, you come back tomorrow, we'll give you, uh, I'll give you the papers to transfer you into the Air Corps. So that was fine, I went the next day. <coughs> now I, I had to go, I took the papers, I went to the headquarters, and who do I face? The lieutenant that refused to sign my papers from transfer. So um, he's looking at me, I'm still, He's sitting down, I'm standing up, he says, uh, uh, he says, uh, I see that you, you, you took the Air Corps examination. I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, uh, did you get permission to, to uh, leave? You do this and go to the, air, the uh, aviation board? No, sir. Uh, I'm very cocky at the time because as I'm standing up and looking down, I see a piece of paper and I can see uh, something like uh, airplane wings up on top. And I'm saying to myself, those are my, <coughs> those are my papers. I'm in the Air Force. He's the one that has to sign them. So I said, no, sir. 
He says, uh, you know, you can get court martialed for what you did. I said, sir, if you want to court martial me, it's okay. In the meantime, now I got pretty cocky with him. Now, in the meantime, sir, please sign my papers and let me get out of here. Well, you never saw Matt Titt so red in the face. <laughs> he, he was a lick, but then from then I was fine, so that takes care of my infantry, all right? Now, I, a couple of days later, I'm shipped out to uh, uh, West Overfield, and from then on, it was uh, uh, take, uh, take what they call pre-flight, and at that time, pre-flight meant uh, uh, getting ready for the, uh, the part of the air course that you wanted. Well, at that time, I was about 20, how old was it, 24, something like that. I'm a young fellow, and I'm full of pep. I want to be a pilot. OK. So I ended up in pilot training. Uh, day after day, I was with an instructor going in an airplane, flying around. He's telling me what to do. And I'm doing different exercises. So about six, seven days later, after we landed, you say, you know, <coughs> you did a pretty good job this morning. And, and uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna start again tomorrow morning. So next morning, go up in the airplane. He says, uh, I want you to do all the flying and I'll be in the back and uh, we'll make sure everything is fine. So I did everything pretty good in the morning. Then when we landed, he said, uh, okay. <coughs> he said, after lunch, you come back here. <coughs> You're gonna fly solo, which means I'm gonna be the only one in the airplane. And but what a thrill that's gonna be. So I, uh, had, had lunch, went back to the field, got into my airplane, I took off, and I took a, 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 I thought it was a beautiful takeoff. I did all my exercises. Uh, I, uh, everything that had to be done, uh, I stalled, I stalled the engine of the airplane purposely, and then we would, we, uh, we, we knew how to restart and stuff like that. So came back to the air base and I looked down and I said, well, I want to make sure that I get into the right flight pattern. So as I turn around, there's a smoke, smoke uh, stack there. There's a barn here. Okay, I'm all set. So I come down, come down low, get lined up with the, uh, Landing field, make a beautiful, beautiful three-point landing. The, car, the, the airplane didn't bounce at all, and I'm saying to myself, hey, "I'm going to be flying from now on all by myself." To finish my training. <coughs> so, as soon as I made my landing and I get ready to stop, all of a sudden the instructor behind me. He took control of the airplane, took off, he's going around. I'm saying, what the heck? What the heck is this, what the heck is this guy doing? So he landed the airplane, and we got out of the airplane. He's fuming mad. He says, what the heck did you do? I said, what are you talking about? I took off beautifully. I had a beautiful three-point landing. I didn't bounce at all. I did all my exercise. He says, what the heck were you doing? I said, what did I do wrong? He said, when you came in for landing, did you check the windsock? The windsock, if you know, is it gives you the direction of the wind. He said, didn't you check the windsock? Well, I said, no, sir, I didn't. Well, I want to tell you. You were, you were gone for half hour. The wind changed 180 degrees. 
So what happened, I landed with the wind instead of against the wind. Now, uh, uh, we, we, were, we were called cadets then, so if a cadet made one mistake, that was it. He says, that's it, you're not gonna be a pilot. <coughs> now I'm really depressed, now what? Well, the next day we had a report to about f four of us that the for four of us that didn't make the grade that they call it washing out. So we're sitting in the waiting room and uh, one cadet goes into the office. He comes out and we said, where are you going? He said, I'm gonna go to gunnery school. I'm gonna be a, a, a gunner. Okay. A couple minutes later, the other fellow goes in. He comes out. Where are you going? I'm going to be an airplane mechanic. Now, p picture me. <laughs> I went, I didn't get into the medical corps. I was training for the infantry. I did radio. I did message center. I washed out as a pilot. What am I? I said, I as a farmer said, what am I going to be, a mechanic or, or, or what? I don't know what. So I was the last one to go in because my name began with Z. <coughs> I walked in, saluted the captain behind the desk. He's got my papers in front. He said, uh, you know, it's just, young, young fellow says, I'm, I'm looking at the papers. Uh, he said, do you still want to fly? Yes, sir. Well, I'm looking at the paper and so say, you know, you would make a pretty good bombardier. You're, uh, the, 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 the questions that you answer and everything, it points to you'd be a, a good bombardier even though you, you may have been a good pilot, but you washed out and that was it. So let's go, let's go on ahead. Now I go all over again, pre-flight training. I get my uh, bombardier training, and in August of 1944, no, now I'm trying to think, 44, 43. So all this time you were uh, in your early days in the Air Corps, what year would you say this was, around 1943? Uh, in 1943 is when I graduated from bombardier school. And where did you go for bombardier training? Uh, let's see. I did, uh, oh, I can't remember, uh, Al Al Allington Field in Houston. Uh, uh, Big Spring, Texas. A couple, couple others, but uh, in August, uh, in August of 1943, that's when I graduated from uh, uh, as a bombardier, and that's uh, a graduation. That's uh, I got my commission as a uh, second lieutenant. Now, once once that was done, now. Uh, 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 I got a. I, I can't remember. I think at that time I w it went to uh, 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 Boise. Uh, I think Boise, Idaho, for, for some kind of training. Uh, in the meantime, that's when we got uh, assigned to a, a crew. Now, uh, a B-17 called the Flying Fortress, the crew was uh, a crew of 10. There's a pilot, a co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier. And then we had a, uh, a radio man, we had gunners, uh, it, uh, the, the, uh, these were enlisted men. They were, they were, 
uh, uh, gunners, they're, they're part of the crew anyway. So we got assigned to them. And then we ended up in uh, Kearney, Nebraska. We were given a, a brand new airplane. And that was our, the start of our journey to get, uh, get, uh, get to England. So from Carter, Nebraska, we flew to uh, uh, in, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. And we stayed there overnight. And the next day, we flew to Ganderfield in Newfoundland. We were supposed to stay there for one one night, and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the next day at about midnight, we were supposed to leave and cross the Atlantic Ocean and go to England. Now you talk about the big snowstorms in uh, Buffalo today. We got stuck in Newfoundland for two weeks because of the snowstorms. In fact, one snowstorm was so bad we couldn't get out of our barracks and we were closed in. They had to come down, bulldozers, whatever, and take the snow away so mm -hmm. that we can get out. And this was in August? No, this was in, uh, no, that would be, uh, I think, no, it, it, to be snow time, it had to be in the winter time mm -hmm. sometime, yeah. So we're now talking late Well, night. I'll tell you what. Okay. I graduated in August, mm -hmm. so it had to be maybe the end of the year or January. Okay. And uh, the, uh, the snow is so deep, uh, uh, they, had to clean, they had to clean the runways for airplanes to come and go. And uh, I would say the snow banks had to be they were so high you couldn't see over mm. them at all. So, so uh, finally the weather cleared up, and on the on the uh, our last day there, it was midnight. We had beautiful weather, cold but beautiful weather, and it was about midnight that we we. Uh, uh, we got into the airplane, we got our orders to fly the Atlantic and get to England. We had a beautiful trip going over and uh, we, landed, we landed in Scotland. We stayed there overnight and then, then we got into a, uh, into a barracks. To, 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 we had to stay there about a week to, uh, to to get some kind of clearance. And then after that, we were, we, we were taken to uh, Nettishall Air Base, which is on my form that I signed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, we, we, we got to the new base. Uh, uh, a, uh, a sergeant came to our, uh, to our truck got us into a little bit of a truck and drive us to, take us to our barracks. So we got to our barracks and we looked around and we asked the sergeant, uh, you know, where are the uh, you know, rest of the uh, crews in here? He said, well, I hate to tell you, but they went on a mission today and they didn't come back. Now, you, you know, that, 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 that hit home. Cause they, uh, uh, when I say uh, we, uh, we uh, this was the officer's barracks, the bomber, the bombardier, navigator, pilot, co-pilot with the four of us. And he said, this is gonna be your home for quite a while. And when he said that, it didn't come back. It was now it just hit us. Sure, we're in the air corps. Or blah blah. We got nice uniforms and all that. But what's going to happen in our future? 
So if I can take a break now, I'll be okay. All right, James. So it is now early 1944. You're now in England, England. and you got a little cold shot of reality here. When the crew says not, they're not coming back. So tell us what happened next. Next, uh, uh, was uh, I'd say about a, uh, about six or seven days later, it was scheduled for our first mission, and our first mission actually was uh, 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 our first. Our first mission was to be a uh, uh, a, a backup plane. When, when, all of, when, when all the planes got up into the air, they, uh, uh, when, uh, let me explain what happens. Uh, uh, at the start of a mission, there might be uh, something like uh, 21 airplanes. There, there were groups of threes, actually. And, and uh, as, as, as each plane took off, they would circle the air base, and one by one, they would meet together. Now, all of a sudden, they, fo they have a formation of airplanes, which you've seen on films and that. Now, if uh, any airplane has a problem, with an engine or something like that, then they, they could drop out and the spare airplane would take over. So as it was that day, the, uh, uh, the, there was no problem. So we, we turned around and we landed. And uh, I, uh, uh, that airplane that, the, that they gave us the first time, they had a name on it called Big red. And uh, the next, in about two or three days, we, 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 uh, we were scheduled to fly on a mission. This time we, we're going on an actual air raid. So that was our first mission going, uh, uh, going into combat. Well, so, uh, on that very same day, this airplane, Big Red, was also in the formation. And as we're going over the Tiger, Big Red gets shot down. So we missed, we missed Big Red by one or two days. So now, uh, now all I can tell you now what we did was uh, we had different missions. Uh, I, I have a list of the some of the important missions at that time. Mm -hmm. We went to uh, went to uh, let's see. I went to Berlin three times. We had we went to a. a the real, the real bad, bad mission that we had was Brux in Czechoslovakia, B-R-U-X. That's where the Germans had uh, oil refineries, and that was one of the biggest sources of fuel for their airplanes, for their tanks and everything like that. And that was the mission for us to, uh, to bomb that. And I must tell you, every mission that we went on, let's say if there were 21 airplanes to a group, you always saw one or two airplanes get hit. You saw parachutes come out. It, it just got to be, it, it got to be a way of life for us. In other words, uh, you, 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 go, you go on the mission, and you don't know what's going to happen. You might come back, you may not come back, but there's something about that that it, it never bothered us because many people a asked me later on, uh, were you ever afraid? I said, I, I can't answer that. 
It's something we had to do. Uh, no, no, matter, no matter what happened, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, our, our, we had a job to do, and that was it. So it just, for some reason, we were not afraid. The reason I bring up this mission to Brux, that was one of the worst missions we ever went on. I, uh, uh, at, at that time, they were, they, they, the Eighth Air Force sent up about a thousand airplanes, and not at one time, but in groups, but a total of uh, 1,000 airplanes to bomb. The, the, this oil section, and uh, as soon as we got there, all of a sudden, we got German fighters shooting at us. Uh, we got anti-aircraft shells breaking up under us. Uh, uh, we saw our airplanes getting shot down. We saw parachutes come out, and the the, the worst thing I ever saw was. German fighters, fighter plane, going after a parachute, all right? And just machine gun. And you see this, and, and, and you see this parachute wide open, all of a sudden it's, it's just one, it just falls up and all you see is straight down. Uh, t talk about getting, uh, I don't know, talk about getting mad. Uh, Sometimes I can't talk about it. I could, I could cry over that mission. Uh, I think on that day, the Eighth Air Force lost about 50 airplanes. About 50 airplanes times 10 in a crew. In a short, in a short uh, space of time, you lost 500 men. Uh, it, they say war is hell, and I'm telling you, war is hell. And uh, well, we, uh, we we did come back. Uh, very sadly, some of the airplanes that went down. We uh, uh, it's, it's it's so hard to say anything now. Uh, you, you, with some of the crew uh, men, you had dinner the night before. You had a couple of drinks at the bar. You had played poker. You played bridge. Next day you go on a mission, and your buddies are gone. An awful thing. And uh, the, this, uh, the one, what I had a, <coughs> I had a. a a, a very good camera it was called an Argus C3 camera, and I had that for quite a while. And I took a lot of pictures. I took pictures uh, when I was in the infantry, all kinds of pictures. On that very day, on that mission to Czechoslovakia, I had two rolls of film, 36 exposures to each. And uh, uh, how, how can I explain it? Uh, any aircraft shells are breaking all around. If you watch TV and you see the black spots, these are <coughs> all around our airplane. The airplane are bouncing up and down from concussion. And I'm, t I'm at no more. Uh, every so often, if I saw a German fighter heading toward us, I would fire my machine guns. If there was nothing there, <coughs> I would take pictures. I took pictures of <coughs> I took pictures of airplanes blowing up. I took pictures of uh, uh, of parachutes, picture after picture after picture. I, I used two rolls of film. I had 72 pictures. Now, when we landed, finally after, uh, it was a rough, rough mission. Uh, finally got back home to our base. 
I'm gathering all my my maps, my gear, and all that, and I'm looking for my film. I can't find them. In all the excitement, something happened. I dropped. They probably dropped, and it went. Uh, they, they went underneath the nose of the airplane, where there's an opening for the uh, machine gun. I, never, I wish I had those 72 pictures. It, I wish you did too. It would. It would have been uh, history. But well, anyway, that, that was it. So uh, that that was that mission. Now. I'm going to tell you what happened after that. Uh, no, I, I can't tell you that. It, it stopped that for a second. So, James, overall, how many missions did you fly? Fifty. Fifty. <laughs> Unusual. That's a lot of missions. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain what that what, what that's like as you go on. Now, uh, some time ago, I had the, uh, I was in the 388 bomb group, and we have a historian. His name is Dick Hangler. He lives in Maryland, and he, he has a, uh, he's, he has a lot of information on our group, historically, and, um, uh, 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 I gave uh, a few years, uh, I think five or six years back, I was invited to go to his home in Maryland because his wife was a uh, president of the, the book club, and they asked me if I would give a uh, demonstration, an interview, like, and re relate all my experiences to the book club, which was good. We had a lot of fun. We lasted about a little over an hour, but uh, getting ready for that, I uh, I didn't know how to approach. Uh, uh, I, I didn't know how to approach an endeavor like that. I said I want to I want to I want to say I did my job that I was supposed to do. Uh, I I don't want to be bragged that I was a hero, uh, nothing like that. So I said to myself afterward, I think what I'll do, uh, I, 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 I thought of a purpose and a title of my presentation. And what it was, I finally figured out with what I went through, my theme was going to be fate, F-A-T-E, or faith, F-A-I-T-H, because I'm a religious person. Uh, uh, the, my prayers, our Father, uh, I'd be lying if I only said them a million times, maybe two minutes. That was the faith I had. So that's... Uh, 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 that, that was my theme because all during my, my missions, I had so many c c close calls. I said, it was, it, I, I was either lucky or somebody up above was part of my faith that was watching over me. So what I'm, I will tell you now some of the things that happened and you wonder how, 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 why did it happen? So one thing was we came back from an, a uh, mission one time, and when we got back to the air base, the uh, airplanes were circling the air base, and they had a, uh, each one, uh, one airplane would land, and as soon as it landed, the group would go all the way around again, and another plane would land, to, uh, you know, one after the other. On one return, we had low clouds over the air base. And uh, you got to give credit to the pilots that we had. The, uh, the system worked pretty well. 
and an airplane would turn around and land and go through the clouds and land one after the other, one after the other. So all of a sudden, the one mission, it was cloudy. Uh, picture flying through a cloud. You, you don't see any land, all you see is the cloud that you're in. And all of a sudden, we're going this directions, and all of a sudden, there's a plane coming this way. When, when, I, when I go like this, I'm in this airplane, I could see the pilot in this, and all of a sudden, whoosh, what made my pilot go down, what made that other pilot go up, we, we missed. We would have had a collision, and that did happen many times in uh, certain things. But that's, that's one thing. Another time we were, we were getting ready for mission, we're ready for takeoff. Our plane is going down the runway, and all of a sudden we hit something slippery, and our airplane skidded. And I'm in the front of the airplane. I'm saying, "God, this is it." I had a terrific pilot. He stopped the airplane. Nothing happened. We were able to take off. The reason I said that was lucky because. Uh, one of my best friends was also a bombardier. And we got to England, we corresponded very often, uh, frequently. And uh, as, as, uh, I, I got a letter. We used, to, uh, we, we used to mail letters to each other. Well, what had happened, my buddy's name was Harry Stollock. I'll never, never forget him. And the very first mission, he's, in the, he's a bombardier, he's in the front of the airplane, and the airplane skidded. As it skidded, it came off the ground, and then it pancaked down, and it blew up. Okay, it, it blew up, that was his very, very first mission. Okay, and it just blew up, and that was it. And uh, years later, later, I'm going to digress a little bit because uh, uh, a few years later, his family came from Rochester, New York. And uh, my wife and I were on a trip in that area, and we stopped in Rochester. I wanted to stop and visit his parents. And they were very happy to see me because we were brought. Well, we were actually friends, but uh, it gets to be like you, know, uh, you get to be like brothers, really, a very close family. And uh, they gave me a picture of his grave, and uh, I have a picture of his grave. They gave it me a picture, and when the airplane blew up, the body parts all over the place. So Harry's, Harry's grave was, uh, what they sent back to the family was just, who knows what. The parents told me they were about, uh, the grave contained the remains of three different people. You know, Harry, a couple of other people. and. Uh, it, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. How do you go to the grave and you grieve over your son or whatever? And you've, it's just a bunch of bones. It, you know, it's hard to say that. It, it bothered me a lot. And I, I still look back sometimes and say, well, uh, when I say fate, mm -hmm. as far as he was concerned, his very first mission, he skidded. And as far as the other fate, our airplane skidded, but not, nothing happened. And we had a full, a full bomb load. So, and then what else can I tell you? The things that were close. Okay, I can tell you about the Purple Heart. Uh, uh, <coughs> 
were flying, were flying over target, and the anti aircraft shells are bursting all around us. And uh, when you see these, uh, you see the shell in front, in all around you, and you say, "Is one? Uh, are these going to hit us? They did hit us. The fragments that hit us because once you land an airplane, we have." You know, holes in different parts of the airplane, but fortunately, nothing. You know, we were okay. So uh, uh, when uh, flying over the target, uh, it, it happened so so uh, fast. A uh, a fragment came through the nose of the airplane. And it shattered some of the uh, plexiglass, and before I know it, I was bleeding around the neck. Uh, my, my eyes, uh, my eyes got uh, shards of the plexiglass, and uh, I was thrown back uh, off my seat. But my, my navigator got the first aid kit, and he, he stopped the bleeding on my uh, on my neck. And uh, after we landed, I, I was brought to the uh, medical unit, and the doctor took care of my neck. And then he put some uh, put some eye drops in my eyes. What he did was uh, he stained he stained the shards of the plexiglass. So he, he spent about one hour with tweezers. Removing, taking piece by piece. Uh, and thankfully, nothing happened to my eye. Everything was fine. And, uh, the reason I say I'm thankful about it because I had a friend of mine that I met uh, about two, three years ago. Uh, he got hit with plexiglass in the eyes, but at the same time. His airplane got shot down, so he ended up as a prisoner of war, and he had a broken arm, whatever. But because it took so much time, but it took him to the hospital, things like that, uh, they weren't able to they weren't able to do much with his eyes. And when I met him a few years back, he was he was about 50 percent blind. So I was fortunate that. It, uh, they would, uh, took care of me right away, so that was fine. Now, James, before the interview, you mentioned, um, I believe it was a piece of plexiglass that actually hit you on the side of the face. Was that no, the that, same? No, that was another time. That was another time. <laughs> this, is what, this is how I got the, uh, uh, I got wounded. Uh -huh. uh, now, I, I, another time while, uh, uh, well, I'm doing my work in the front of the airplane. Uh, my uh, my oxygen mask came off my face. It was just hanging by one strap, and I tried to put it put it back on again. I couldn't find the clip, and I took it off. The small piece, which I found later in the airplane, it went right by my face, hit hit the uh, metal clasp. Bent it into a V shape, and that's why. So I had to fly with hold my oxygen mask by hand. So you might say that was my fate. This is where this is where I say my fate came up, but I did have my faith too. And, uh, and then there was another time. Uh, Coming back from a mission, and and our, uh, our our flight path was such that the, we were, we fly west to a certain point, and then fly north mm -hmm. for a, a spell, and then another west to get across the channel. So uh, it was a big mix-up. Uh, well, at that time, uh, our airplane was uh, we call second in command. The, the the lead airplane had some kind of a problem, 
and uh, they lost their radio transmission and uh, 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 through, some, through some kind of a signal, we were, su we were supposed to take over and lead the group out, but the, our radio man got the message that uh, we, from headquarters not to, not to take the northern route, but to leave the target and go straight west over the channel back to base. So as we tried to get into position, Another airplane beat us to it and started to head up north. We could not get in touch with that airplane. He wasn't, he wasn't supposed to do that. We were the ones who wanted to take over. But we couldn't communicate by radio that he shouldn't be there. We were the, should, we would be the ones flying. So we ended up flying north. We're hitting headwinds, uh, very, very strong uh, headwinds, and all of a sudden we, we get into a fog bank, and you couldn't see you couldn't see any other airplanes. So now we're flying north, and fortunately I had a very good uh, navigator. We're, we're flying over the. We, we found out that we. We flew over the Ruhr Valley. The Ruhr Valley in Germany was the biggest uh, area, the most protected area, because of the war materials that they were able to. Uh, so we're flying and flying, and uh, picture flying. You don't see, you don't see sky. You don't see the ground. You're in the, this big. <coughs> you're in this big uh, cloud bank, and uh, now the problem was you're running low on fuel. If you're running low on fuel, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna do this right now. So, so by the grace of God or whatever, all of a sudden we hit. We, we leave the uh, fog bank, now we're in an open area. And according to my navigator, we hit the, we were, we were uh, over uh, Belgium, which at that time was, uh, it was after D-Day, and, and we had part of the, uh, uh, we had part of the, uh, you know, the, the land taken. So when we landed, the pilot said, well, he said another 20 minutes, we would have, we would have had no fuel. Well, that okay. is cutting it close. So that does cutting it pretty close, mm -hmm. yeah. You just mentioned yeah. uh, D-Day. Uh, do you have any uh, specific memories of that time? D-Day? Yes. I do very much. Mm -hmm. uh, D-Day was on a Tuesday. Um, at that time in June, we had uh, we had day, a double daylight saving time. So on a on a Sunday, we flew a later mission. Uh, I'm gonna guess about maybe six o'clock or so. And we still had about three or four hours of uh, daylight. We had a mission to hit the coast. So that, that, that's on the Sunday. We bombed a target, came back home, and uh, we came back. Uh, we, we, we knew nothing of D-Day when it was going to happen. So actually, after one mission, most of the time, you had maybe two or three days off for you for another mission. So that was on a Saturday, on a Sunday, rather. So on, on Monday, on Monday we get called to have another mission. 
which was all right. Well, we came back. We were a little bit tired because we had two missions in a row. Uh, we didn't get too much sleep. So my navigator and I, after we landed, we went to the bar at the officer's club, had a couple of drinks, had a nice meal, and went back to the barracks to, uh, you know, just, just go to sleep, you know, rest up. So as you got back, it had to be maybe about, well, maybe 11.30 or so, on the loudspeakers, briefing, I forget what, yeah, briefing right away, briefing. I forget the time, the briefing was 2 o'clock or whatever, it was in the morning. So we got to the briefing room. This is it, boys, D-Day. So now we had, th uh, this will be our third day in a row with very, very little sleep. So uh, we, uh, <laughs> we got into D-Day, and, and D-Day that day was uh, anything that could fly in, in, the, air, in the air force. It, it was up in the air. All kinds of uh, bombers, all kinds of fighter planes, everything you could fly. We we're going to hit the French coast during the day landing, and, and the, uh, we were told if you have if you have something as soon if you have any trouble with your airplane, don't turn around and come back because anything coming towards England is going to be shot down. I mean, so if you have any trouble, just go south and travel all the way down to the to the south and making a big, you know, round turn to get in. So that's all right. So as soon as we landed after our first mission on D-Day, there's a jeep came up to us. Uh, you're gonna go on another mission. You know, from one airplane go to another. And my pilot said. We flew three days in a row. We haven't had, we haven't had any any sleep at all. It, it's impossible. Well, that's what you have to do. So, so my navigator and I got to the briefing room, we were looking at the maps, and all of a sudden, my navigator drops his head on the table. He just, he just fell asleep. That was it. So. I got hold of our pilot and said, Don, we can't, we can't fly. We're sleeping. It's suicide to go up like that. We couldn't do anything at all. So I was able to uh, cancel the shot. So we didn't have to do that. Well, that's good. You're welcome. Oh. And uh, <coughs> what else can I say? I told you about my mass, purple heart. He had to tell you about the Does uh, Ashley want to hear this too? Oh, she'll be right there. Uh, Come so, uh, <coughs> talk about the mission where I get wounded. Uh, after the doctor took care of my neck, took care of my eyes, he says, uh, I want to put you in a hospital for two or three days. I want to make sure you're all right. He said, uh, the way you fell back, I want to see if you hurt your back, I want to check your eyes again, check everything like that. So we'll keep you in the hospital two or three days. And I said, Doc, I got to tell you, Doc, I refuse. <laughs> what, 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 what do you want? He said, we, 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 we don't know what happened to you. We got, we got to check up on you. I said, Doc, I got news for you. My crew from Connie, Nebraska, okay, like I said before, from Connie, Nebraska to New Hampshire to Newfoundland 
to Scotland to the base. Our crew hasn't had a pass. It's, it's something like the, it, 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 something like eight, eight to ten weeks, something like that. And I said, "Got to tell you, Doc. Today, today starts our three-day pass to London, and I'm not going to give it up." <laughs> so he said, "Well, it's up to you, but it's a what you do." So. He got me all bandaged up and put on a very, very thick bandage around my neck. Uh, and he said, well, when you're in London, if something happened, if you start bleeding or anything like that, this is where I want you to go. I said, OK, fine. So we get to, we get to London. And when, when I say we, it's, my pilot, co-pilot, navigator, the four of us, I was went together. Uh, we went, went to a restaurant to have, to have a dinner that night. So we, get, we got to the restaurant, we sat down, we had a couple of, uh, had a couple of cocktails, and we ordered our food, and we had some kind of meat. There was, wasn't too much meat because the meat at that time was rationed. So when I got my dish, uh, I got my dish that was a, uh, uh, maybe a couple of ounces of meat and a little potato or something else. And I look around and have no mustard. Now, I like mustard very much. I'm sure you do too. So uh, you know mustard. So I called the waiter over. I said, can I have some mustard, please? He said, sure, sure. He came back and lost it, and he came back with a little bit of a, a plate, maybe <laughs> an inch and a half, you know, round, with a little mustard on it. I'm saying to myself, God, they, they even ration, besides rationing the meat, they ration the mustard, too, I guess. So now, take my fork. I cut a piece of meat, put it on my fork, dip it into the mustard, put it into my mouth, and all of a sudden, I'm up like this. Huh? 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 Got the bands around me. I can imagine that to the, the people, to, to the people, you know, in the restaurant. This man, I, he, something happened. He's something with his neck. Huh, huh, huh. I'm, I'm doing all kinds of motions. And then I, I grabbed some bread, started eating some bread. Cause my mother always thought if you had something hot, bread. So about five minutes. So, and then before, the, the waiter came over, the head waiter came over, everybody, what's the matter, what happened to you? Now, everybody thought I was going to die, or something happened to me. I said, the mustard. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the waiter said, well, what did you do? I said, I just put my fork into the meat, I dipped it in. Oh, no, 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 you, you, you had the pure mustard. He said, <laughs> the way we do it, you just, you touch your meat and you put maybe the, uh, uh, the, the uh, j j j just enough meat for, for I mean, just enough mustard to cover a, uh, the, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a, a a, p a pen point, something like that. No, 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 no. Well, that was it. So that was, that was, uh, so after that I all brought up that story that, uh, uh, that happened to me, but it happened because I had this heavy, heavy bandage <laughs> around my, around my neck. Mm -hmm. Uh, James, earlier in the interview, you mentioned that you had 50 missions. Yeah. Why so many? 
uh, right after right after D Day, right after D Day, uh, uh, a, a a tour of duty was a tour of duty was thirty missions, and right after D Day. Uh, Everybody thought the war was going to be over in no time at all. So they said uh, missions would be unlimited. And to us, un unlimited was you fly to get shot down or whatever. So there's a, uh, there's a big stake about that. And they, uh, they, they finally decided, well, uh, if you do 30 missions, if, if you do 30 missions, that'll be a tour. And uh, uh, if, if you volunteered to do 30 and go home for 30 day furlough and come back again and do another tour of duty, uh, you, you're, you, uh, you, you would uh, start, start another tour of duty. If you didn't want to do that, then instead of 30 missions, you fly 35 missions, and that'll be a tour of duty, and you go home for, for good. So we decided, uh, the whole crew did, we'll, uh, we'll, do 30, we'll do 30 missions, let's go home for 30 days. Uh, we had a couple of weeks in uh, Atlantic City after that, so who knows, by then maybe the war will be over, but it, it never was. So. Uh, Went back to England, and uh, 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 we, we went back, and, and uh, we were going to start a, a second tour of duty. Now my whole crew got all. Uh, uh, we didn't fly again as, as a crew together. We had we had individual crews. So uh, my uh, my. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, our our uh, com com commanding officer of the base, his name was Colonel Cox. He came to me after a few days. He said, Jim, uh, I want to start you on another, your other tour of duty. And he said, uh, I have two crews. I have one crew that just came over. They have no missions, they have no experience at all. And then I have another crew, they had about 15 missions. They've been in there, they've been in combat, they're very well experienced. They fly in a good position in the, in the group. It's so, uh, I'll give you a choice, which one would you like to fly in? Which to me was odd because uh, a, a commanding officer has openings for crews. He doesn't give you a choice. He said, you're going to fly with this crew. I, I need you there. So he gave me a choice. And to this day, I look back and say, that was, that was part of my fate. I'll tell you why. So. I said, all right, Colonel, you know, Colonel, I'd like to meet the pilots of these uh, crews. So we met at the, at the bar at the club, and the first one that we brought up was the brand, the pilot of the new crew. His name was Tom Morrison. So we talked to each other, and I asked him different questions. Uh, uh, I got to tell you right now, uh, you, would th you would think that I was a psychiatrist analyzing <laughs> a person that's going to mean something to me. So we, we talk, had a nice conversation. Then about a half hour later, the colonel came over with the captain of the experienced crew and went for the same procedure. We talked and all that. And after they left, my colonel said, uh, <clears throat> oh, Jim, uh, well, what do you think? I said, sir, I'll, uh, 
I want to fly with the brand new crew. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, I said this crew has no experience. They haven't been, they haven't flown any missions. They're going to fly in what they call at the end of the, the group. They call that the tail end Charlie. Got no experience at all. Any other crew, they fly in a good position, a protected position in, in the formation, and they get all experience. So I said, sir, you, ha you gave me a choice. You, you asked me, <laughs> OK? You didn't tell me I had to do that. You gave me a choice. That's the one, that's the one I picked. OK. Now, what I tell you now, you can wonder, was that my fate? I'll tell you why. So, uh, uh, I was introduced to the new crew, and I said to them, I want you to. Okay, so James, you've decided to fly with a new crew, yeah. and fate so, comes. So, uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to meet the entire crew. So uh, we all gathered together, and I said, I want, you, uh, I want you to understand one thing. I have flown 30 missions. I've seen everything. I have a lot of experience for different situations that come up. And uh, I, I, want, I want you boys to agree with me. If something comes up, and I tell the pilot what he has to do, I, I, I want that to be the, I want to be the, the ruling. Says, okay, so the pilot says, oh. He said, don't worry about that, we'll take care of it. So the, uh, the first, the first and second mission, we're flying what they call tail end Charlie. We, we, we bought, uh, the group, uh, we were part of a group that dropped the bombs in the target. And while I'm putting away my maps and all my equipment, all of a sudden I look out. We're all alone in the sky. When I say all alone, it, we, were, we were part of a, I think it was about 21 planes in, in, the, uh, in the group. And all of a sudden, we're all alone. Top, pot, to pot, top. What the hell's going on here? He said, well, he's, one of my engines is kicking off. I'm going to shut it off because I don't want to hurt the other, I don't want to hurt the other engine. So I said, Tom, get this GD airplane up there. You boost these engines up, and you better catch up with that, catch up uh, right you know, with, with the group. So it took about five minutes or so, and all of a sudden, we were back in formation with the group. And as soon as we got all together, I happened to look up, and I said, over the intercom, I said, boy, I want you to, I want you to look at one o'clock high, which meant one o'clock high. We look up, there are two German airplanes, okay? As you see those two boys up there? If they caught us all along, the, the, uh, if, they, if they caught us all along, what these two airplanes would do, I've seen it happen before. They just turn around, they, they go after your airplane, and they shoot their machine guns, and they play games with you. They shoot all around you, okay? And then all of a sudden they come in for the kill and that's it. So, so that was, that was up here. So when we landed, <laughs> the, whole, the whole crew came out to me, hugging me, all the tents, sir. <laughs> are we glad, are we glad you, you were with us because we, you saved our lives. So when I mention that particular instance, uh, I would say, including me, if I wasn't the, 
the tenth member, the, uh, uh, I would say that I, I actually saved ten people. Because if they had no experience, if they stayed back, they would have been shot down. So now with the new crew, again, a couple, about one or two missions later, uh, we're leaving a target, and I'm putting away my uh, putting away my maps and all that, and I happen to look to the side, the uh, the navigator, his name was John Dempsey. We called him Jack Jack Dempsey. Okay. So, so Jack is is like this. He's got his head back. And I look at him. Uh, I guess Jack, pretty tired, taking a little bit of a rest. Now, let me say, I'll, I'll bring up fate again. Okay? So once I saw it, as I said, uh, he's tired, he's, he's taking a little bit of a nap. Something made me do this. I looked again. Once more, when I looked around his oxygen mask, he was turning blue. Now I knew, I knew what was happening. And, and the first thing I knew was he, he has no age, he's going to die. You've heard about that happened many times, even today. So I grabbed him by the neck, and what happened? He leaned back against his oxygen tube. He shut off his his uh, supply, and when that happened, you don't feel pain or anything. You just go to sleep, and that's it. So I, I grabbed him by the neck. I uh, I took care of the uh, oxygen tubes, turned them off full blast. <coughs> I'm slapping his face. God, God damn it, Jack, don't die on me. Jack, come on, wake up, wake up. So, so after about a minute or two, he's shaking his head. He's back to normal. So uh, uh, if, if, you, if you remember this Jack Dempsey now, I would say uh, I saved another life. If I didn't turn around, that we would have landed with a dead navigator. Mm -hmm. Now, in later years, this was 1944, in about 1980, about, let me say about 1980, I was managing a drugstore for the Liggett Rexall Drug Company, and we had a, uh, we had a sales promotion and the, uh, I, I, was a, I was a manager then of a, a Rexall drugstore in Weymouth Landing. And so happened I was the winner of the sales promotion. The prize was two week vacation in California with the Rose Bowl, the Rose Bowl Parade New Year's, the works for my wife and me, and we were having a good time. And the uh, the host, the host of the uh, of the group, uh, at, we stayed at the I think it was the Ambassador Hotel, and the, uh, he and his wife had a suite of rooms, and every day we'd meet about four four thirty in the suite. We had a few cocktails, and then they would take us out to uh, uh, to dinner or show whatever it was. So the second third night, uh, we were downstairs, and the host came up to me and said, Jim, you see the bartender over there? And you know how these portable bars for individual groups? And I said, yeah, I see him. He thinks he knows you. I look at him, I don't think so. It doesn't look familiar. Well, let's go and talk to him. So I went over to him and, uh, I, and I asked him, I said, 
Are you, do you always live in the West Coast? He says, yeah. I said, well, I'm from the East Coast, so I, I don't think we ever met. It was 3,000 miles apart. I, uh, did you go to school, college, or anything? Yeah, UCLA, somewhere like that. No. I said, <clears throat> were you in the service? He says, yeah, I was in the Air Corps. As soon as he said Air Corps, I look at him. I said, Jack, Jack Dempsey. <laughs> they came around, we hugged each other. And Jack Dempsey said to the host, sir, I want to know, this is a man that saved my life. So how do you, you see what I mean when I say fate? How come that I happen to be, uh, I happen to save his life? How come I happened to win that prize? How come that we, I met him years later? So I thought that was something, something unusual, really. So, so many things happened. Like I said, I could be here all night long and right. tell you. Would you like another thing? I got pretty close. Go right ahead. Oh, yeah. uh, every time we went into uh, London for our past, we always went to some nice restaurant and night have a nice dinner. So one day I said to my buddies, you know, uh, I said, I said, you know what? I, I miss a lot. They said, what? I said. Yeah. Let's let's see if we can find a Greek restaurant in London. I wouldn't mind going to a Greek restaurant. So I could have something that I really like. Okay, that was fine. So, so we checked, we checked, we found a Greek restaurant in London. And we went in there. And uh, the restaurant was about the size of this room right here, a very small restaurant. And instead of a plate glass window front, it had plywood because they, they had been bombed before and they, they had broken glass and all that. So we walked in. <coughs> the, uh, must have been the owner came up to me. I started talking Greek to him. Oh, he was happy Greek. We talk, uh, I was talking Greek finally with him and all that. We had a great time. So he sent over a, a nice platter of all kinds of Greek uh, goodies. Uh, little meatballs, uh, stuffed tomatoes, stuff. And we had a couple of beers, we had a nice, nice meal. And all of a sudden, there's an explosion. I mean, a big, big explosion. The restaurant had uh, uh, and then dinner where uh, all, all those dishes and all are hanging up on the wall, pictures. And all of a sudden, pictures are falling down. People are get, getting under the table. The, uh, the stuff on not being grabbed was just uh, that plywood just came in forward. <coughs> so right off the bat, we got the money, we knew what to do. We paid, let's get out, let's get out of here. So we went out. What happened? In the next, uh, just across the street, there was a, a building. He got hit with a, uh, what they call a V2 bomb. The V2 bomb, when the V2 bomb came over, there was no, uh, 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 it, it, the only, the only time you hear it is when it hit, and the Germans send these over every so often, and this one leveled the uh, building next to us. So we were lucky; we missed. We almost got killed. Very uh, lucky indeed. Yeah. So we walked. Uh, we walked out, and uh, the smoke all over the place, and fires and all that. So we, as we're walking down the side there. I'll never forget this. There's an elderly couple. The woman is laying flat on the back. Her husband is hovering over her, and he's talking to her. She's dead. 
and the poor man is crying. My darling, we were walking here and all of a sudden, I, we were holding hands and now you're gone. I, 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 I don't know, what to, I, I think of that sometime, I, I, I tear, so that's fine. So we got back to the base, <clears throat> my buddy said to me, Jim, from now on, from now on, you do not recommend restaurants. <laughs> so, that, that, so that's another time where I say, was it my fate? I, I could, there's so many times that we could have been killed, I don't know. So James, um, toward, toward the end of the war, were you still flying missions right up until BE Day? I'll tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. at, uh, with the new, the new crew, I did uh, six, I, I did six missions, mm -hmm. and then my my colonel said to me, "I have a I have a, a crew that needs a lead bombardier." I said, "Okay." So uh, with the new crew, I did uh, uh, I did fourteen missions because when we went back, uh, I already had the thirty. And the deal they gave me was, if if you do 20 missions, we'll call that the second tour. So it's lucky again that I ended up doing 50, and I'm I'm here to tell you about it. So with that, uh, 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 with, with that crew, I had a lot of uh, uh, being a, a, a lead crew. It, uh, it was a big responsibility because now you, you're the lead airplane. You have about 20 airplanes behind you in formation. Uh, if you, it, it, as a bombardier, uh, it's your job. You better hit the target. If you miss the target, if you miss the target, everybody was in danger. So uh, uh, I did pretty well as a lead bombardier, and uh, on December, on December <coughs> 31, 1944, that was the end of the year, and uh, I, I led a mission to uh, to Hamburg in Germany. And uh, 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 when my bombs dropped, uh, I, do, I, I used the Norden bomb site, and it was very, very accurate. If all the information was uh, if the information was very good, and you you dropped your bomb, you you hit the target pretty well, so that was fine. We uh, I bombed the target, and when I came when I came uh, when, as soon as I came over the uh, over the target, I picture this one when I dropped the bombs. They drop this way, and then they, as you're going, that's that's the curve that you take. Now, as soon as you're, as soon as the bombs hit, your airplane is directly over the target. So I dropped the bomb. I looked down. And I said, "Okay, we got a good mission. We we hit the target just right." So we get back to the base, and we go into a big room, and they. Uh, the uh, people from intelligence, they talk with all the crews, they get all the information they can, they ask where did the bombs hit, and every crew said they run on a target. That's fine, everybody's happy. Then about 10 or 15 minutes later, the, the group bombardier came over to me, he said, Jim, you, you missed the target. I said, no. I said, what you, what the, I, I didn't miss the target. I, said, I saw the bombs hit, not on the point, but 
uh, let's say I was supposed to bomb Boston. I hit Boston, you know. And I say, you check it on the other crews, they, they all agree. No, no, no. He said, I got the pictures. So you be him. And, and the pictures show you, you, you missed the target. I said, that can't be. So I said, well, he showed me some kind of pictures. I said, now look, uh, when you find a group, of one airplane has what they call the cameras. And they take a picture of the of the, the bomb impact. Now, if 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 the plane if the plane should go, if the plane tilts this way, you see what happens. He's taking the picture this way. I see that picture is probably somebody else's bombs. No, no, this is it. So I said, oh, I'm not going to argue with you. Because in the meantime, once it landed, I had two or three scotches, all right, <laughs> to settle my nerves. Mm -hmm. I said, if you say, hit the tag, I missed the tag, and okay, I missed it. Okay. So now, I said, now it's, it's the end of the year. The next day is New Year's, and uh, uh, I, I had a good night's sleep, good meal, and about late, later at night, I uh, decided to uh, go the, to the officer's club and have a few drinks. You can shut that for a second. Mm -hmm. In 1945, hopefully you're on the tail end of your missions. Tell us what happened. Okay, so uh, December 31 was, was Hamburg. Mm -hmm. The next day was New Year's Day, and uh, later on that day, we were going to celebrate New Year's. We went to the officers' club, and we're, it was about it was about midnight, twelve thirty, one o'clock, and uh, I had a few drinks. I figured you had a big mission; you don't have to fly for a couple more days. So it's about one o'clock in the morning. Someone came over to me and said, Jim, you you have a telephone call. I said, Come on. Are you kidding me? It's one o'clock in the morning. Well, who's calling me? You know, he's not. The Colonel Cox wants to talk to you. Okay. Went to the telephone. <coughs> uh, uh, Colonel, this, this is Jim Zagraff. What's up? He says, I need you to fly special mission today. I said, I said, I just flew to Hamburg. I'm not supposed to fly today. I said, I said well, 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 uh, how about the other bomb, you know, the other lead bombardiers? Well, he said, I got two of them are in London on the pass. He said, I got, I got another two or three. He said, they're dead drunk. He passed out. I, and I said, sir, what makes you think? What makes you think I'm 100% normal? He said, well, as long as I can talk to you like we're talking now, I think you're all right. I, uh, uh, it's a very important mission. I want you to lead it. OK. <laughs> Got the jeep, went over to the briefing room, and uh, I looked at the targets, the maps, and everything like that. And at that time, if you remember your history, uh, we had the battle of the bulge, if you remember that, okay. And the target was, uh, the target was a, a, a railroad yard where it was a it was a big triangle in the middle uh, of uh, of tracks in other words at that triangle the uh, the germans could bring in supplies switch them from one 
uh, track to another. It was, it's a very, very important uh, junction right there. So, oh, okay. And it was a small track. I mean, it, it, it wasn't like saying, um, I'm going to hit a big city, you, you know, you can't miss. This was just a, uh, just a big, big triangle of tracks. Well, okay, so uh, I studied the maps. Uh, I got all of my information, uh, and I'm feeling, you know, <laughs> I didn't have two or three digs. I may have had four or five, and at that time, uh, at that time, uh, drinking didn't bother me. It was, uh, your body was such, your, uh, you, you, you never realize you're under a stress. Uh, uh, your body needs something to, you know, you have to calm down, period. So I got to the airplane. Uh, I got up in my position. I, uh, I grabbed the oxygen tube and I started sucking a lot of uh, oxygen, trying to get back to normal. Uh, uh, one of the listeners came over and said, sir, you, you put your machine guns in the wrong way. I said, oh, I'll take care of them for you. Okay, so uh, we, uh, uh, we, we got, we, I, I, we got everything ready for me. I, I, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I couldn't think clearly until I could, get, you know, get back to normal. I kept sucking on uh, oxygen and all that. <coughs> ready to take off a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a, a major came up to me. He, he introduced himself. <coughs> He says, I'm going to be the command pilot. Yeah. What the command pilot was, he sat in the co-pilot seat, and um, my pilot did all the uh, flying, but the command pilot was the one that controlled the entire, uh, the entire formation. If anything, he's, uh, he's probably telling, uh, giving orders about it close your ranks, uh, something like that. So, okay, so we're flying along and flying along and I'm sucking air and all that. And, and finally I get to the point where uh, I think I feel pretty good now. So uh, we get close to the target and uh, when we get close to the target, we have what they call an IP, intersection point. And what that means, uh, when we, uh, 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 just before that, the bomb site gets hooked up with the automatic pilot, and I'm the one controlling the, the airplane with my adjustments on the bomb site. So uh, I'm getting I'm getting everything, uh, all information, all right, and then the uh, major calls down. He says. Uh, he said, hey, Lieutenant, says, uh, are you okay? I says, yeah, I'm fine. What's the matter? He, he says, yeah, the other group uh, on the other side, they already made their bomb run. So I look over to the left, and the other group is flying that way. And I'm still having, I still haven't reached my, my point. Then I'm, God, did, did, I, did, did I make a mistake and all that? So I check and I recheck everything. So now the major calls down. He said, "Are you sure? Are you sure you got the right?" I said, "I'm pretty sure I got it." So I don't know if I can record this. He said to me, "You, you better be right, or else I got, I, I'm going to have your ass." Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that's the wrong thing to say to. So I said, well, okay. So now I made up my mind. I said, I, 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 I know I'm, I'm doing the right thing. So I, I, I get the IP just right, and I start my bomb run. 
everything is working perfectly for me. And I happen to look over to my left, uh, see the other groups, and all of a sudden I see any aircraft hitting the other group. So I call up to the major, I say, sir, would you like me to follow the other group? No, 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 you're doing all right. <laughs> Stay where you are. <coughs> okay, now, if everything is perfect. My mind is absolutely cleared. And my big success, my bombs, no, when, when I drop, when my, as, uh, the, the way the bomb run is, when the bomb day doors are open, all the other planes do the same thing. As soon as my first bomb drops, it comes out, the other planes hit the switches, so now we get a concentration of bombs. So, <laughs> bombs away, I look down, right in the middle, right in the middle. In fact, I have pictures of the bomb. Now they call that, uh, they call that a shack, which means uh, uh, like dropping bombs into a pickle barrel, all right? So, uh, terrific, terrific. <laughs> so, so we get back to the base, we landed, and there's a, everybody's, Everybody's happy that they, they know what happened. So the, uh, the group bombardier came back to me and said, Jim, uh, you went the bomb hit. So my answer was, I'm not going to take it. Where'd the bomb hit? I'm not going to tell you where they hit. I said, you know, you told me I missed the target, OK? Now I'm going to tell you. I don't know they I'm not going to tell you where they hit. But you, you, you got to tell me, you got to make my report. I said, you know what? Send the jeep over, get those pictures, uh, get those pictures developed right away, and then you tell me where the bomb sits. So it can, took about 10 minutes to get the pictures. Be beautiful. I mean, the, the, uh, well, Let's say, if you, if you tell me, I want you to hit Bunker Hill Monument, that's okay, bingo, I hit it. That's the same with this mission, everybody was happy. So, uh, uh, the Colonel, Colonel Cox came over and took me up front. And he said, I want you boys, I want you all to understand that uh, our bombing record hasn't been so good lately. And so you gotta tell you, Jim brought it up where it has to be. And I got to tell you, Jim was celebrating New Year's Eve, and I got him away from the bar, so I'm going to take him back with him a few more drinks. And that's so how he went back. Yeah. So that, that was my, that was the big thing. So I did, uh, I did 20 missions with that, uh, uh, with that group. Had, a, had some very good missions, and uh, and then the, uh, the group bombardier said, Jim, uh, uh, now that you're all done, you want to stay over. I'll, I'll, I'll make you my, my assistant group bombardier so you can get a promotion and all that. Uh, so I said, let's, I, said, I, have, I had enough combat. You signed my papers. I'm going home because I'm going to get married. And when did this take place? It took place in uh, about April of 44 when I finished my second tour of duty. So it was April 45? 45. Okay, so right before VE Day. I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> so yeah, we, we got home and uh, uh, my sweetheart met, met me. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to get married right away. We had two weeks to make preparations. And we got married. And uh, we, uh, we stayed in Boston at the Charles River Hotels, facing the Charles River, uh, the honeymoon suite. And uh, it was on a Sunday. 
and uh, Monday, uh, Monday went out for dinner. We did some, our own sightseeing. And then Tuesday morning, about 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on our door. And uh, yes, I said to her, who the heck is knocking on the door? I said, 10 o'clock in the morning. So I said, who's there? I said, it's the, it's the May Day I come in, so she came in. I said, I said well, you know, what's up? Uh, you know, what do you want? Well, the management told us if we get all our work done this morning, we can have the rest of the day off. I said, what for? She said, D-Day. So that's D-Day. <laughs> A second day of a honeymoon. Mm. So uh, that's how we celebrated. We uh, that night went to the uh, Latin Quarter in Boston, and uh, that's what Barbara Walters' father at that time owned the Latin Quarter. So we, we got to the Latin Quarter. There's a long line outside waiting. So I went up to the head of the line to uh, give my name, whatever. And the, the maitre d' saw me. Hey, Jim. Now, the maitre d', uh, while I was going to college, I worked as a busboy at, the, at a hotel in Boston. And we worked together, so he recognized me. And now all of a sudden, he's maitre d' at the Latin Quarter. I got the reservations already, come on in. So he took us in, we had a nice, nice time, and that, that was uh, our time. So now um, at the, uh, we stayed in Boston about five days. Now I had a, now I had a report to Atlantic City, what they call the R&R, &R, the rest of recuperation. And uh, it, was, it was the month of, uh, we got married May 6th, uh, and we were in June. In, in June, we were in Atlantic City, beautiful weather. We were supposed to be there for two weeks, so I had to go through. Uh, uh, I had to go through physical and other things like that. So I went through uh, one day with got my uh, physical, everything was fine. Now I had to go, the second day, I had to go, I had to visit the psychiatrist. That was part of the, you know, whatever it was. So when I went to the, when I went to the psychiatrist, I knew, uh, I, I knew what was gonna happen because uh, when we came home on furlough after my first two of duties, we heard a lot about the psychiatrist. Some of these guys were uh, needed more psychiatry than even. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I walked in. Uh, there's a young young doctor that he's got his le legal pad about this long, you know. Uh, he's got his piece. Uh, uh, how many missions did you do? I said, give him the whole story and all that. And I said, uh, uh, do you feel good? I said, oh, yeah, I feel good. He's writing. Uh, how's your appetite? Uh, I said, pretty good. But you know what happened, Doc? As soon as I sit down and eat, I lose my appetite. Then I, I smoke a cigarette. And then I have a couple of drinks. How much? How much do you drink? I, well, a couple before lunch, maybe two or three at supper time, and and then later on we go back. How many drinks? He's right here with you now. Uh, oh, uh, how, how much do you smoke? Uh, two, three days, two or three packs a day. He, and I, I smoke maybe a pack. He's right. He's going crazy. Uh, uh, yeah. 
do you have any battle dreams? I says, yeah. He says, tell me about your dreams. I said, well, the usual thing, Doc, you know, you're on a mission, your plane gets blown up, and you find yourself in a parachute, and you're coming down. I says, the usual thing, he's right away. <laughs> no, and how, uh, uh, you, you said you don't eat too much. I said, uh, what do you like to eat? He's right, you know, I, I was eating so much on my honeymoon, I, mean, I couldn't button my <laughs> so, so, so fine after about half a Lieutenant, I know, it's, I know what's the matter with you. You have combat fatigue. I had no combat <laughs> Come on. Uh, a, a newly married couple, beautiful uh, bride, no more combat stuff. They be right, right all the way down. So when I got back to the whole tosses, I got to tell you what happened, honey. She couldn't stop laughing. So now the next, now the next I had to go back again to get my reassignment. So I, I got into the personnel office, and the uh, the officer has my records in front of him. He said, uh, "I see a recommendation. You, uh, you're going to be a bombardier instructor." I says, "Yeah, that sounds good to me." I said, okay, I'm going to send you to Midland, Texas. Now, Midland, Texas then is not what it is today. It's just, uh, uh, it's just an area with desert all around. I said, no, what are you doing? I don't know. I said, what for? He said, I'm going to send you this so you can learn how to be a bombardier instructor. I said, come on. I did 50 missions. You mean to tell me I can't t teach someone how to uh, use a bomb site? He said, well, that's, that's SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. Well, so finally I said, you know, sir, do you, have a nice, do you have a nice desk job for me? He said, are you serious? I said, do you have something for me where I can have a nice desk job, but I can fly four hours a minimum a month to get my flight pay. Oh, yes, sir. I'll put you in what they call personnel distribution. So make a long story short, what it was, I had to go to New York City for 30 days to learn about the GI Bill insurance and stuff like that. And it was pretty good, my wife and I, I, I ended up in Indian Town, Gap, Pennsylvania, and my wife was w with me. We lived in Hershey, Pennsylvania. It was very nice, and we had a nice time at the base. Uh, everything was good. And then uh, one day I had called into the office. Uh, uh, you have too many points, discharge points. Uh, you have to get, take a discharge now, or you can volunteer to stay in for another year. So, so I said, well, what do you think, honey? Well, we were having a good time, it, 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 like we did. Uh, you know what, I like the all now. So that was the end of my service. Yeah. Can I give you anything else? Okay, so you were discharged. Yeah. And I get discharged. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I uh, I got my I took my examination for my license. Finally. Finally. <laughs> and uh, with what rank did you leave the service? Uh, first lieutenant. And what medals and accommodations did you earn? Well, I got the Distinguished Flying Cross. I got the Purple Heart Medal. I got the, the Air Medal. Actually, I got seven Air, air Medals. You, you get what? You get a medal, and if you get any more, they give you a cluster instead, yeah. 
and I got the campaign medal with five clusters. I got the good conduct medal, the Army good conduct medal. I got the Air Corps good. <laughs> and I got the recent French Legion. Tell us a little more about that. What? The French Legion of Honor. Well, you gave it to me, yeah. She did, I didn't. <laughs> when did you receive it? Uh, on the 70th anniversary of D-Day, June 6th. And it was right here at the museum? Yeah. And who presented the medal to you? The, uh, the French consul from Boston. Any thoughts on that? Well, uh, uh, about oh, a little over a year before that, I was reading in my Air Force magazine about this uh, fr French medal and explained what requirements were needed to, uh, to, to be nominated for it. So I filled in my information just like I did it. And it was, oh, it was over the year that I said, well, nothing's going to happen. And then I get a beautiful letter from the council that you've been selected and you came here, we get the mail. It was a nice day there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would you like to say a few words about the museum itself? Uh, I'd like to spend more time someday. I gotta got see all these things here. And I can give you maybe a few more. Well, really not much more. Okay. My 50 missions and then uh, my, uh, my first tour of duty. Uh, I was on three missions to Berlin. Now, uh, a mission to Berlin entailed at least a thousand airplanes. And what, uh, when you hit something like Berlin, uh, you just picture a group of airplanes, uh, one group following another, over and over, until a thousand airplanes went over. And, and uh, you, you didn't have to navigate when you get to Berlin. All you had to do was look ahead. If you saw this big black cloud, that was the anti aircraft shells bursting. And I just, uh, on TV recently, I, they had something on Berlin. Uh, in Berlin, we, about 50,000 about 50, uh, German citizens were, were killed, so. And people ask you sometimes, don't you feel bad? I said, no, no way. So when I see German fighters killing my bodies in a parachute, I don't, I don't give an SHIT who I killed on them. That, that, that's a God's honest truth. When I say war is hell, it, it is hell. Yeah. Now, James, after um, after your discharge, did you uh, join any veteran service organizations? Uh, I was in the reserves for five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a letter one day from President Truman. Uh oh. Would I like to sign up for another five years? Uh, no, it wasn't President Truman. Uh, was it Johnson? I'm, uh, uh, anyway, I got another letter. Would I, would I, uh, would I sign up to reserves for another five years? Well, at that time, I was working for the Lilly Drug Company. I was doing very, very well. I knew that I had a good future with them. Uh, I had a beautiful little baby daughter. And uh, I just, 
Uh, I didn't want to. I didn't want to take a chance. Uh, uh, being in the reserves, it, it, it meant I could. They could call me back in if something happened. So I, I sent back, refused it. And I think maybe about two months later, the, the war in Korea broke up. Fade again. Yeah, and pick up the paper one day. The Air Force is in need of bombardiers and navigators. <laughs> okay. Now, as a bombardier, I also went to navigators because uh, I would have been in like that. James, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up this interview? I'm going to tell you one thing. Uh, I, I was very successful written, working for. Uh, Look at Rex Saul. Uh, I, uh, I got a new, I got a lot of experience. Uh, I was what they call a troubleshooter. They would assign me to a drugstore that was going down, and they gave me a contract. If I made any money for the store, I would get 25%. I, I was very good. I, I had a good ability, and put it that way. and. Uh, and then I ended up in finally in Worcester, and I had a chance to buy the drugstore, and that was it. So it's very, very successful, and uh, we did pretty well as a citizen. Uh, financially, we did pretty well at the drugstore, and uh, uh, when it came when it came to the mighty dollar. Uh, I treasured it a lot, and I'll tell you why. If, going back to the beginning of my talk here, you asked me, did I know anything about the Depression? I used to shine shoes as 12, 13 years old. And one day I went out in the morning, and I shined. I had nine. I shined shoes for nine people, right? Nine men. So I got 45 cents. I said, well, time to go home. I started walking home. A man stopped me in the street. He said, shine my shoes. I said, yeah, you're OK. So I shined his shoes. He gave me a 50 cent piece, and I gave him my 45 cents. Okay, now I got a 50 cent piece. And a 50 cents piece, I tell you what, what it could buy in those days. So I'm walking home and I'm happy. Up with the 50 cent piece, catch it. Catch it. All of a sudden, I missed it one time. And the fell on the sidewalk and it broke into four pieces. Okay. It was a counterfeit, whether the man knew it or I didn't know it. I don't know, but when I, when I lost that, it, it did something to me. And I, that, that 50 cents for that day could have been, uh, could have been our, our dinner that night, really. So when it comes to the yellow dollar, I, I earned it. I'm going to make sure it's mine. Mm -hmm. One final question, James. Sure. How, what, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Uh, how important? <coughs> uh, it was very important, very, very important. Uh, it's because well, uh, because in my combat experience, I, uh, I saw the uh, I saw the, uh, what's the, futility, is that? Uh, I, I saw the, uh, uh, I, uh, well, I'd be in England, we, we play cards, play a little park, a little bridge, say goodnight, next day we fly, and your body gets shot. 
que... Uh, uh, it got to the point, well, uh, I, I lost another good friend. You didn't grieve over it. You said, that, that's war, 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 war as hell. Before you finish, I just thought of something because I told you about fate. <coughs> when, I, when I picked a new crew, I flew six missions with them. And uh, either the third or fourth mission, uh, we were on the mission. And the position we were that my point was, was in, I could look up ahead and see the, see the, uh, 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 all the other airplanes. Well, up in one spot, I'm looking up there, and I said, there's one airplane. Uh, I would have been on that airplane if I picked the experienced crew. So, we're flying over the target, and all of a sudden, that airplane got a direct hit and it blew up in one big ball of flame. Okay, I would have been on it. And when we landed, Colonel Cox came up to me and said, Jim, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. And he, even he said, I gave you a choice. If I didn't give you a choice and I told you that's your crew, I'd be sending you to your death. He, he, he couldn't find the right word to say. So when I say fate, I could have been, if I said, oh, if, if I was thinking of my safety, I'd say, oh, I, I better fly with the, with the old crew, their experience. Okay, I picked the new crew. Why? And I say to myself, why, why, why? And here I am, I can talk to you and tell you all about my experiences. Really? Yeah. James, you have had uh, some incredible experiences, and oh, yeah. we thank you so much for I'm coming not, to the museum. I'm and, happy to do that, yeah. And relating your experiences. Yeah.